Today on This Week Health. One of the things that's really important to know about the USCDI is that it's required in all certified EHR systems. And so that covers 80% of ambulatory providers and 95% of hospitals across the country. And so we try to be judicious to say it's in effect the minimum data set of the healthcare delivery system. So we want to be cautious because it applies to everyone and we don't want to put additional burden on vendors and providers for a whole bunch of data elements. It's like, well, I never use that. Why am I being forced to think about that? Thanks for joining us on This Week Health Keynote. My name is Bill Russell. I'm a former CIO for a 16 hospital system and creator of This Week Health, a channel dedicated to keeping health IT staff current and engaged. Special thanks to our keynote show sponsors, Sirius Healthcare, VMware, Transparent, Press Ganey, Sempris, and Veritas for choosing to invest in our mission to develop the next generation of health leaders. All right, today we are joined by Mickey Tripathi, National Coordinator for Health IT for the ONC. Mickey, welcome back to the show. Great, thanks, Bill. Really delighted to be here. Well, the, the last time we talked, you were not in this role, but it was soon after that that you you stepped into this role. You you've been busy. We have a lot to talk about: TEFCA, USCDI, electronic prior authorization, RFI, information blocking, health equities by design. Uh, a lot of stuff going on there, but. Since you made the transition and we haven't talked since then, tell us about your first year in the role. What has it been like? Yeah, it's been it's it's been quite a whirlwind, I think, <laughs> as you might appreciate. There are just a few things going on in the country. But so far it's just been it's been a great experience and a ton of stuff to do. So this isn't my first tour in the federal government, I should say. I was I worked for the federal government in the Pentagon in the 1980s, which tells you how roughly how old I am. Then I worked in the Air Force Controller's office on the Air Staff, the Air Force Chief of Staff's office, and then moved to the Secretary of Defense's office. And so in some ways had a, some of the same experience in terms of you know, now I'm, I'm in the Secretary of HHS's office, then I was in the Secretary of Defense's office. And so I sort of came to it with a little bit of an understanding of you know, kind of how those relationships were, kind of what it feels like to work in the federal government. But uh, HHS is a very different agency than uh, the Department of Defense. So lots of, lots of similarities. You've got the, uh, the the military services, which are kind of like our operating division. So there we had Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, Army. Here we've got CDC, FDA, <laughs> um, SAMHSA is the operating agency. So a lot, of, a lot of similarities, a lot of differences. The one, you know, the one thing I'll say at the end is, is just one of the things that I really was was happy to find that I regained or it brought back all of those same feelings about uh, sort of the privilege of working for the people and on behalf of the people. And there really is an esprit de corps, I think, in the federal government to be working on issues that are, that are important to people. And as soon as I started on day one, all of that came rushing back. Um, so that, that part's been really fun as well. It's an interesting role. I mean, clearly the federal government is the largest payer. So there's an awful lot of influence that goes with the position. You also have policy. So from that perspective, there's a lot that you can do. But I remember talking to the uh, certain general and he said, predominantly his role is a position of uh, a bully pulpit influence is, is how he described it. It wasn't a lot of making people do things. Now, do you feel that same way or, or is there some policy and some levers that you can pull? Yeah, no, there certainly is policy and levers that we pull. I mean, the bully pulpit is certainly a big part of the job. I mean, for sure. You know, so I think of it as, you know, kind of the spectrum of hard levers to soft levers. And certainly on the soft lever side is the bully pulpit and that coordination part of being sort of trying to connect dots, trying to encourage people to act in ways that are both in their interest, but also in the public interest. And how do you connect the dots on that? Because it's not always obvious to people. So I think connecting those dots is an important part of the job. I think what may be different about ONC versus the Surgeon General, and I can't speak for the Surgeon General, I don't know all of the authorities they have, but the ONC, we're, we're a regulatory body. I mean, we regulate electronic health records through our certification program. It is a voluntary certification program, but I think as almost all EHR vendors feel compelled to uh, to certify their systems because they're required to have the providers who are their customers are required to have those certified systems in order to participate in, in different CMS programs and, and also commercial programs have you know started to lean on ONC certification as you know kind of a standard that they want to make sure that the EHR systems that that they're working with have in place. 
So we have that. And then also from the 21st century, we have the information blocking provisions as they were, which are about uh, the encouragement of, of information sharing among providers. That's also a regulatory function that we have. So we have a little bit more of those hard levers than, than I think the Surgeon General's office may have. And so we've kind of got the whole spectrum there. All right. So my gosh, there's so many things to talk about. Let's, let's start with TEFCA. So yep. tr trusted exchange framework, common agreement. Is that, is that close? The trusted exchange framework and common agreement. And I did not make agreement. up that name and ONC did not make up that name just to. <laughs> no, no. Acronyms, as they say, acronyms happen. Right. Uh, major movement in January. What do we need to know about TEFCA at this point? Yeah. So uh, I think the most important thing to know about TEFCA is A, that it's now available for networks to participate in. And then the question is, well, what the heck does that mean? Imagine a world where you think about your cell phone and think about cell phone systems. And let's say that AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile weren't connected. All of them great nationwide networks, but each of them kind of a private network. So if I wanted to call you, Bill, I would need to know, well, I'm on Verizon. Ugh, you're on T-Mobile. We can't talk. Or we can only text, but we can't talk, for example. And then with AT&T, it's like, well, I can call, but I can't text. That's a little bit of the situation that we have today in the clinical interoperability world with respect to networks, that there are lots of networks out there. And the private sector has done a tremendous job, I think, moving forward and putting together networks. But because it's the private sector, each of them has got its own, you know, sort of peculiarities and its own uh, uniqueness. And so they don't seamlessly connect in the same way that cell phones, for example, or electricity grid across the country. I mean, a lot of people may not know that our electricity grid isn't a single grid. It's a whole bunch of subsystems that are, that are connected together. And we experience it as a single system, just like we do with cell phones, but it's actually a bunch of subnetworks that are connected up. So what the 21st Century Cures Act did is say to ONC, create a governance model and a model for connecting up those networks so that we have that same kind of experience as a user, whether you're a provider or a patient or a public health agency, how do we create that backbone infrastructure so that you can connect with anyone, regardless of which network they're on, and you'll experience that as being in the same network and you won't have to worry about what's going on in the back end, on the back end. So that's really the, you know, the, the most important part of that, I think. And the analogy, another analogy I would use is think about the way that bank systems work today. The ATMs, um, that's, that's where I was going to go. It's interesting you use yeah. cell phones and not ATMs because Tefka would be like that, that common ATM framework that started to come together at, at some point, which allowed us to go to any ATM and-, and Right, you and I are old enough to remember when you have to look at your card and it's like, oh, this is a Cirrus. I'm in the Cirrus network. I have to go find a Cirrus ATM. So my kids, they're kind of like, well, my kids are like, what's an ATM? <laughs> they're just, you know, they're just, they're yeah. just using Venmo. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that's the same analogy. But and and one of the things that you know, the Tefka is more about the back end structure. So how do we, how do the banks have a system where I, you know, take money out of an ATM with the ATM that's right down the street here, which isn't my bank's ATM, but as soon as I log into my bank's portal, that's up to date, right? It actually has the transaction there. There is a backend system that makes sure that your information is accurate, reliable, and up to date. And that's what we want Tefka to be able to do for medical records. So when you show up at your provider, there's a backend system that makes sure that to the greatest extent possible, the medical records that that provider has access to are up to date and reliable so that they have the best information available to them. If people want the details about Tefka, Mickey and I had a conversation last year. You can go look at that show. And we went into details of the Sequoia project and their role in it and a bunch of other things. They, they can really get the deep dive into it at that point if they want the details. I there's even more for... details now available on the website because now that we're able to release it, that's all out there now. We'll get to our show in just a minute. As you've probably heard, we've launched a new show, Town Hall, on our community channel, This Week Health Community, and it airs on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'll be taking a back seat to some of these people who are on the front lines. Town Hall is hosted by an array of talented healthcare leaders who are facing today's challenges head on. We're going to hear from professionals and their networks on hot button issues, technical deep dives, and the tactical challenges that healthcare faces we have some great hosts on this. We have Charles Boise 
and Angelique Russell, data scientist, Craig Richerfield, Lee Milligan, Reed Steffen, who are all CIOs. We have Jake Lancaster and Brett Oliver, who are CMIOs, and Matt Sickles, a cybersecurity first responder. I'd love to have you listen to these episodes. You can subscribe on our community channel, This Week Health Community, wherever you find and listen to podcasts. Now, let's get to the show. I want to get into the pragmatics. So healthcare providers, what are they going to need to do or what should they be doing now in preparation for connecting, participating in this, the TEFCA framework, or as we said in the analogy, the ATM framework, so that the medical records, as somebody gets a lab drawn over there, it's, it shows up over here. Instead of the point-to-point -point connections that exist, I imagine TEFCA can act as a, a way to, to get it from a lot more sources. Sure. So there's a couple of things. I think for the vast majority of people using certified electronic health record systems or electronic health record systems in general, right now, they probably don't need to do anything. And what they need to do is wait for their network, which is either Commonwealth or the eHealth Exchange or you know Care Quality, which is a, a different one. Their network is going to figure out what their participation is because TEFCA is for the networks to participate in. So if you're a participant in a network, like you're already... In, as a part of that network, at some point, they will sort of make a plan to connect to the broader TEFCA network. And for you as a provider, you, you know, will be asked to sign an additional agreement or it'll be a rider under the contract you've already signed. And then after that, your vendor should enable that within the system, within your EHR. So you actually won't really have, even have to do anything. You'll at some point just experience that, wow, I can connect to more people than I was able to before. <laughs> and that's kind of cool. For those who aren't yet, you know, a part of those networks right now, then I think that it's um, the idea is to either connect to one of those networks now, if that was, if you for some reason felt like I wasn't going to get, you know, any value from those networks, it may be that once they you know, sort of join TEFCA, that you feel like, oh, that's the point at which it makes sense for me to join that network now because it connects to any other network, and I can choose which one makes most sense to me, because. I don't have to worry about, well, who is that particular, particular network connected to because it'll be connected to every other, every other network that's participating. So if you're not a part of the network, there's either, if you, you know, have the opportunity to join one of those, you may, you may want to wait and see if, you know, what, what happens with their, you know, TEFCA participation and then join them or to see if there are any new networks that either get formed or, or join and then um, deciding which ones of those you want to participate in. So we anticipate that there'll be some new ones. I mean, this you know, TEFCA is certainly about connecting the existing networks but we also expect that it's going to be a motivator for new new networks to form and for you know, really innovative approaches to this. Is this going to replace the HIE? So if I have a regional HIE, Southern California, we had a regional HIE in Southern California, and it it struggled from time to time for funding and and some other things. Is, is this going to provide the the backstop for that? That I was always worried that that thing was not going to be funded, and all of a sudden we weren't going to be able to exchange records. Yeah. So it's. Well, you, you raised a couple of issues there. It, it certainly shouldn't replace HIEs. The idea would be that HIEs can connect to this network. And then you're in Southern California. Now you're not only connected to the, those folks who are in that HIE in Southern California, but you're connected to everyone else in the country. And that HIE doesn't have to do any more work. At that point, they're just connected to everyone else. So conceptually, and I think what we've seen in other network industries is that that actually adds value. People think that, oh, one network conquers another one. Well, what actually happens is the participation rises in both because of the network effects that everyone feels like, oh, I'm actually getting great local stuff in my local network that I didn't want to lose by, by joining some other bigger thing that maybe didn't provide that. Now I get all of that through that local network. So I actually you see people sort of join and participate in. And we've seen that in the private sector with different networks that connect well, care quality and Commonwealth, which were seen historically as competitors. It turns out that once they connected at some level, participation in both rows, it was a win-win or a positive sum game. It wasn't a negative sum game. Interesting. We're going to get to information blocking, but before I get there, talk to me about how TEFCA is going to impact the patient experience. Yeah. So it should be in a couple of ways. One, the first is the backend experience, which is to say that, and it may be an indirect benefit that, you know, the patients only sort of indirectly notice, which is to say that they should have the experience that their providers have more access and easier access to their records than they had before. So they're not being asked to lug records from, you know, one provider to another, for example, paper records. They're not being asked as you know, many people have to do, which is 
I just got imaging done at that hospital down the street. And you're telling me I have to come in in person to pick up a CD-ROM and bring it to that you know, hospital down the street, that it should take away a whole bunch of that stuff. And as I said, that's indirect, right? For a lot of us, we may not actually notice that because you know, we, we, these things happen incrementally, right? And then so at some point it's like, oh, I didn't have to do that, great. But that's, you know, that's people's expectation. So in some ways they don't celebrate it. They're like, well, that's what I expected anyway, <laughs> was that that was gonna be happening. So that should be happening in the background. They also will have the opportunity to connect to the network themselves through a vendor. And what that will allow them to do is just like they connect to a patient portal today, for example, you may you know, log into the patient portal at your provider. Right now, that just gives you the information from that provider. But with the Tefka network, individual access is a required purpose, meaning that you know, there, there are vendors who could be certified to be on the network. And once they're on the network, you could use one of those vendors to basically ask for your records from any provider, not just the provider that, you know, that is connected or is providing you with that portal. So for those you know, patients who choose to do that, it should be easier for them to gather their information regardless of where, you know, which provider they go to. As we know, like Medicare patients, they often see five, six, seven, eight different providers. I and mean, so that could be a real convenience. I want to move on to USCDI version three. We added some new data elements, health status, procedure health insurance, patient demographic, data classes, some interesting things in that. Is USCDI version three related to TEFCA in any way? Just so I, I, I don't jump topics here and confuse people. No, it is. Yes. Yeah, so the USCDI itself in general is related in that the requirement for, because one of the questions that, you know, that anyone might naturally ask in network is well, what information gets shared? Like, is there a minimum requirement of what needs to be shared? Is there a maximum? Is there a flexibility? So what we said as a part of TEFCA, that the minimum that's required to be shared is, is the USCDI version one. So not the version three, but the version one. And the reason we did the version one is because that's what's um, required in certified EHR systems is the USCDI version one. And I can describe why you know, version two, version three, and how those fit into the picture. But we basically said that USCDI version one, that's, that's the minimum expectation that everyone should have about the information they get. And the reason that we wanna do that is we wanna be able to say, how do we create a uniform floor across the country? So that regardless of where you are, you're in Southern California, you're in Nome, Alaska, you're in Athens, Georgia, that when you query the network, you should have the same expectation that at least I can get this amount of information. Maybe that's not everything you need and you have to figure out other ways to get the additional information, but everyone should have that basic service of, I should be able to get this minimally. So that's what the USCDI version one does. The version one, the reason we have version one, version two, version three is that- the, you're, you're, you're adding data elements, right? We're adding data elements, right? So every, every year, year and a half, we add more data elements and we do it, we try to be very judicious about that. And so we have a, a very public process where the public um, industry, federal agencies can submit their, their, their suggestions for additional data elements to add. And then what we do is we have a set of criteria, like how mature is that data element? Because people might suggest something that they want that, but it's like, well, there's not a good standard around it. And so if we try to get people to use it, they're not going to know what to do with it, or it's just creating a mess because people are just going to be putting free text in because there isn't a good standard around it. So we haven't, you know, helped solve problems. We've actually contributed to the problem. And so we go through a, a thing of, you know, maturity and in industry importance, because one of the things that's really important to know about the USCDI is that it's required in all certified EHR systems. And so that covers, you know, 80% of ambulatory providers and 95% of hospitals across the country. And so we try to be judicious to say it's in effect the minimum data set of the healthcare delivery system. So we want to be cautious because it applies to everyone and we don't want to put additional burden on vendors and providers for a whole bunch of data elements. It's like, well, I never use that. Why am I being forced to you know, sort of think about that? So every year we you know, try to go through it methodically. And then we have a law, you know, sort of a, a longer process for saying, all right, how does the next generation like USCDI version two then it goes through a process of voluntary certification for, you know, for those vendors and those who, who want to use it. We're able to say, all right, we'll put those into voluntary certification so that people can start to incorporate those if they want. And then if it seems to get um, really good uptake and really strong uptake, then we'll take some subset of those and say, all right, now it's a requirement 
for everyone. So that's why you see USCDI version one, version two, version three, and we do it as an evolutionary kind of process to allow people to offer what they think is important, but also allow them to incorporate it over time. Yeah, people may appreciate this, they may not, but I imagine if you speak at a conference and there's a line of people there, about a third are gonna come up to you and say, you're not moving fast enough. About a third are gonna walk up to you and say, you're moving way too fast, we can't keep up. And so that's why you yep. try to come off as reasonable. It's like, hey, we're, we're doing this with USCDI version one, but we're still making progress on two, three, because we have to do those things in the interest of public health and, and other things, get that data set together. As we look at these, these specific data elements, health statuses, procedures, health insurance, patient demographic data classes, talk about why those specific data elements were added in version three. Sure. Yeah. And just, just to refine, the, just one last point on just building on what you just said, it's also very iterative, I think. And so we work closely with providers and with technology developers and others. And when we add something to the list, what that does is it gives impetus to the industry then to say, oh, okay, now we're seeing what the pipeline is. So we're seeing these data elements, like what's in USCDI version two, what's in USCDI version three. We have a pretty good sense that those are going to be included and required for certification. So let's get all of the work done to make those as usable and mature as possible. And I've for 20 years prior to joining the federal government a year ago, I was on the private sector side. And you know, I can assure everyone that that's how we responded, like with the Argonaut project and other projects. When we saw what ONC put into the next USCDI, you know, sort of the future, that, that future USCDI version one um, and version two, that was when we looked and said, oh, we better get to work on those now. And we better make those more mature. So it is very iterative. We take from industry what we think is going to be ready. And then we say, oh, okay, we're going to do this. And then they say, oh, let's make it ready. <laughs> let's do everything we can to make it ready. Is there any chance that industry would get ahead of you and say, hey, these 10 health systems have come together. We've decided that these sets of data elements make sense. And between us, we've sort of codified it and we'd like it to be considered. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, that happens all the time, for sure. And there are there are different groups, different organizations, either through HL7, the standards organization, or through different of uh, these fire accelerators and different other just kind of groupings of providers, sometimes in HIEs and other places where they do they do that. And then some of them will just move ahead with what they've created and then hope that it'll get incorporated into the USCDI as well to give, you know, sort of added, added uh, boosting to it. But at the end of the day, I think one of the challenges for everyone is that our healthcare system is so fragmented. You can have 10 providers who agree on something, but it's still really hard for them because you know, they're fighting against, I mean, I don't mean fighting, but you know, their vendor has a national business base. And so their vendor is like, well, it's really hard for us to create your standards and your standards and your standards and your standards. And in healthcare, because it's so fragmented, you know, the role of ONC and CMS end up playing a lot of that role of you know, just sort of defining, well, here's a floor that we can all agree to. And then everyone's like, all right, that's what we can all agree to for sure, because we all know that we, we're going to have to do that. So again, it's you know, very much an iterative kind of process. So back to your question on USCDI version three, there's, there's often, uh, as I said, we get a lot of input from industry and providers. I, mean, I think you know, some of the big ones, certainly the insurance information is a whole new category of information that we added in version three that wasn't there before. And that's it. The insurance information is just really important. We heard it from providers the importance of being able to have that information as they go from, from provider to provider, but also for patients, because remember the USCDI, the US Core Data for Interoperability, not only is it for interoperability, meaning provider to provider, but it also defines what is required to be made available to patients, for example, in a patient portal or through that fire API that they can use the Apple health record or you know the app of their choice to be able to download information. That the USCDI defines what's minimally required to be in that. And so for patients, insurance information is just incredibly valuable for them to be able to have that access to the information. And my hope is that where we're able to head with that is, I think what would be sort of a huge win for patients and for providers is not having to fill out the clipboard every darn time you go to, yeah, I was, <laughs> to I was a just, hospital. I was just thinking that if, if, if you put health insurance into no. USCDI and I, I go to a new employer or whatever happens for me, probably the next step is becoming a Medicare patient, but I, I give that card one place, potentially that should propagate across anybody who's participating, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. 
yeah, no, there's still a bunch to do to make that happen. But the foundation is to say, have it represented in a standardized way across all EHR systems. Then you're able to start build, building stuff on top of that and different applications and things. So for example, take the smart health card. I don't know if you got a vaccination. If you did, you might've gotten a vaccination credential, a digital one. You certainly got the CDC white card. Um, I was going to say, where's my card? My card's on my desk somewhere. It's under papers. Right, but... right, right, right. But now it turns out, I mean, the federal government, just to be clear, the federal government does not endorse a vaccination credential, nor do we endorse a particular standard. But it turns out that what the market has done because of the foundation of electronic health records that are out there now, because of the requirements that the electronic health records support FHIR and a particular version of FHIR, FHIR R4 APIs, and because of the push from ONC to make patient access uh, a key part of what technology is required to do, to allow patients to have access to their information, bring it into the device of their choice, and then have them be able to do what they want to do with their own, with the information that they have in their hands. All of those things kind of came together with the vaccination credentials so that, so that the industry itself came together and said, we're going to create a standard that's based on Fire R4, and that's based on that paradigm of a patient having being empowered to have their own information in their own hands and have that represented in a way that's convenient to them. So where did that go? Now, 80% of US-based individuals have access to what's called a smart health card. And the smart health card actually has a QR code. I mean, I could pull it up. I didn't, I should have pulled it up before, but it's got a QR code that has your vaccination information in it. Imagine now going back to US CDI version three. What's stopping us from moving forward and saying, well, what if I put your insurance information in that same QR code, for example, and your other patient demographic information? So that when you show, go to the next hospital, you just scan your QR code and it just picks it up and says, done, no, no clipboard required. Um, those are the kinds of things that we're hoping that laying this foundation, the industry can really innovate on top of that and come up with these kinds of solutions. Yeah, the VCI, when that story came out, I commented on it on the Today Show, which is a little 10-minute show I do every morning. And my comment on that was, this proves we can do it. When there is a, an agreement, we can, we can do the interoperability that we need to do. And this should be like an, a case study for, we can grow from here. We can do other things the same way we did this. I'm going to be remiss if I don't keep us moving here. Information blocking. What stage are we at in the information blocking Actually, I think you called it information sharing. That last time you like corrected me and you said, no, I, let's stop talking about it as information blocking. Let's talk about it as information sharing. So where are we at in this? Yeah, I still firmly believe that. Unfortunately, I wasn't around when they created the law. So the law actually calls it information blocking and the ONC rule, which I also wasn't around when they wrote the, the, the final rule that also calls it information blocking. So I personally feel like we should be talking about information sharing, but it does say information blocking. So I always try to remind people that when I say information sharing, that's what I'm talking about. So people aren't confused. So where are we? The uh, rule went into effect on April 5th, 2021. So it had been delayed a number of times. The 21st Century Cures Act was passed and remember it was passed in December, 2016. And so when, when I took this job in January of 2020, it had been four years and uh, over four years, or yeah, when I took in 2021, sorry. It had, been, it had been over four years since the passage of the law and none of the key elements of the 21st Century Cures Act had gone into effect. So we came in and just said, you know, that we've got to get this moving. Um, that is the law and, and it's going to help solve some of the problems that we have in interoperability and that, that we're preventing us from having the kind of pandemic response that we wanted. So anyway, so April 5th, 2021, it went into effect for all of the um, actors that are named in the role. So that's providers, uh, certified health IT developers. So the EHR vendors that we all know, as well as, as well as others who are certified and then health information networks and health information exchanges. Those are the three actors that are covered by the information, by the information blocking uh, regulation. So that went into effect on April 5th, 2021. The law is really peculiar in some ways in that what it did is it gave the Secretary of Health and Human Services who delegated to, to ONC to create the policies to define what is information blocking. How would you define that from a policy perspective? But enforcement is with the Office of the Inspector General. So we work in partnership with them, but we don't do any of the investigation and the enforcement. We basically say, here's the policy, and that's what went into effect on April 5th. You're required to comply with this policy. 
And we set up a, a complaint portal, as the law specified, so people can come in, they can file a complaint on the ONC website, but that gets passed over to the Office of Inspector General, and they're the ones who do an investigation and any determination that someone might be in violation. The reason I mentioned that, though, because you asked where we are in this, ONC on April 5th said this goes into effect, but OIG has to finalize their rule for how does enforcement happen. And that hasn't been finalized yet. The calendar that they published publicly said that they are going to make their final rule available in March of this year. Now that's not binding. So we, I don't have any inside information on whether that, whether they're going to hit that date or not, but that's, that is what they've publicly made available. So once that comes out, then you have the OIG saying, and here is how enforcement is going to happen of the information blocking regulation. I have two follow-ons. One is, did you mention insurance carriers? Because don't insurance carriers fall into this as well? They do not. So insurance carriers as insurance carriers do not. The law did not name them as, as actors. Now, I will say there is a caveat that an insurance carrier, as we know, in this world of you know, a lot of vertical and horizontal uh, sort of consolidation, there are a lot of health insurers who also are providers. They bought a lot of provider practices, for example, and or they also operate what would definitely be called health information networks. So purely as being a payer, they may not come under information blocking, but to the extent they're a provider, then they would, or to the extent they're a health information network, then they would. This was a heavy lift. There was an awful lot of pushback on this, right? We had some, some big players. Uh, I'm not even sure the American Hospital Association didn't push back. Some of the large EHR providers pushed back. This was not a simple simple thing to sort of get the coalition to form around this. This was a big lift. But the good news is bipartisan. I, I, I remember the vote in the Senate was like 93 to 7 or something. I was, I, you may know the exact numbers, but it was overwhelmingly for the 21st Century Cures Act. They were saying, look, this is in the best interest of patients across this entire country. And very few people disagreed with it. And if they disagreed with it, they didn't disagree with the core elements. They had like some sticking point was the reason they didn't uh, vote for it. So this was, in my mind, the, like the last piece of legislation I can remember being this bipartisan. So everybody is saying, look, it, it's time for this. But then when it came down to the, the brass tacks, actually writing out what this policy means and whatnot, that's a hard process, isn't it? I mean, you have to take a lot of feedback and there was a lot of back and forth on that. And that wasn't necessarily you. That was probably the previous right. I wasn't in the job then. They, they, they published the final rule before the change administration. But yeah, there was certainly, it's, it's very complex. So it's really, really complex. And there's certainly a lot of different you know, sort of views and a lot of different interests that, that weighed in you know, pretty heavily, I think, in the whole process of getting the public feedback on the draft rule and then the final rule and, you know, and all of that going on. So do, do we anticipate this will change much? I mean, will, will there continue to be feedback and will this continue to morph over time? Yeah. So a couple of things. One is, is that we are in an ongoing process of, we take questions, we interact with, and we do a ton of outreach. And for any of your listeners who who want to interact with us directly and have us come and speak at, you know, events, or you, you want to talk to someone about it, please contact us. We are more than delighted to do that. And we do that you know, every single week. And we've got a clinical team, we've got a policy team, and we're always doing that kind of outreach. We also take all sorts of feedback and input, and then we um, respond with FAQs and like information sheets and all that. So if you go to our website, you'll see that we keep adding FAQs. Um, and we also add information sheets when we get a whole bunch of you know, questions in a particular area. It's like, oh, uh, we thought we clearly communicated, but communication is only in the eye of the receiver, right? So if they're not hearing it, <laughs> we clearly have not said it right. Yeah, so yeah. we're going to create an information sheet that, you know, that tries to do that. So there's a lot of, I don't know if it's you know, really morphing so much as it is to say, sometimes no rule is going to cover, especially in healthcare, where it's so fragmented and so local, it's never going to cover every particular circumstance. And so that's where we can, you know, help to provide some clarification to say, here's what the rule says, and hopefully that helps people. And that's, that's an ongoing thing. And I always consider that that's not a, you know, that's not a bug of the, of our system. I think that's a feature of our system. You define the big policy, but everyone keeps adjusting. We all need to keep adjusting to make it work. I'm going to ask you about early wins, but I do want to point people to the website again, because 
It was interesting when I was reading about USCDI version three, I went to your website, great resources, phenomenal resources. And then I started reading the comments below. The comments below are an education in and of themselves. Uh, really smart people thought out, laying these things out in terms of the comments. And I learned a ton just reading through those comments. So again, great resource. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now these are not, I think one important thing for everyone to realize is these are not, ONC is not sort of Moses delivering the tablets down <laughs> for every, based on the deep wisdom that we have. This is like the industry and, and really smart, engaged people who are experts and have experience and have a tremendous with this, who are providing us with this information. And then we're able to sort of take all of those things, try to process and say, here is the consent to the greatest extent what we see as the consensus view of how to move this and move this forward with the best possible information that everyone has been able to provide to us. Do we have some early wins with regard to information sharing, information blocking at this point? I guess a couple of things. One is it's too early to tell. Enforcement hasn't kicked in and you've got all those things. I would say one win is that it's now in force. It took over four years, but it's now actually in force. And I think to the extent that there is a lot of discussion on it. We get a ton of questions. But to me, I think that the quick win is that it's now on people's minds. And people are starting to think, how does this, how is this different than what I do today? And whether they take those actions is going to be a part of you know, what we see, how that unfolds. But in my mind, the reason I always tried to emphasize, you know, that this is information sharing, the reason I didn't like information blocking as a characterization, and I've worked for the last 20 years deeply with the provider community both my parents are providers, my daughter's a provider. So I just didn't like the framing of information blocking as being that, that the parties are guilty until proven innocent. It, it has this suggestion that everyone has got their chief information blocking officer who's you know, erecting <laughs> all of those interferences. And in my experience, it's really more a question of priority. It's that organizations have 10 million things in healthcare delivery on their priority list. And it's really hard for them to work you know, their way through and they don't have the resources to do them. And what this is saying is you know what the Congress has spoken and they've spoken very loud voice, as you said, and that means you need to move this up your priority list. Um, you just need to move it up the priority list and make it a priority and don't keep kicking it down to, yeah, we'll get to that one next year. We'll get to that one next year. And of course, like, like we all know, anything that's like below number 10 in your priority list, you just never get there. So this, that's what this is saying. And I think the fact that it started that conversation in people's heads, that, that to me is a quick and early win. Yeah. I mean, what you just described, when people ask me about healthcare, it's like, why can't I do this? Why can't I do this? In my experience in healthcare at this point, I, I hear people knock meaningful use. Yeah. We didn't do this right. We didn't do this right. And it's easy to, to sit back and say, why did the Buccaneers lose over the weekend? But at the end of the day, I would estimate about half of America would still be on paper records if it weren't for meaningful use. If we hadn't done something to move it up the priority list, it, it would have just kept being, hey, we're in the middle of pandemic. We can't, we can't do this. We're in the middle of this. We can't do this. And could you imagine going through this pandemic with a majority of the American uh, medical establishment being on electronic medical records? I no, can't, I can't, I mean, uh, impossible. I totally agree. I, I totally agree. I mean, I think that that was a, just a huge achievement, but hopefully as we look back, we'll see that that was a mammoth achievement and overall very successful, which is to take arguably the most complex part of our economy and in relatively short period of time, I mean, 10 years for the most complex part of our economy and very, very fragmented, flip it from being almost very little penetration of electronic health records to the point that 90% of them, over 95% of hospitals and 90% um, of ambulatory providers have really sophisticated um, health IT systems in their offices. And I know people may complain or not like their EHR system for this or that or the other thing, but I think most people would agree that a certified EHR system is a pretty sophisticated piece of technology. And I think that happened in a relatively short period of time. And now we've got that foundation. So we can say, now what do we want to do with it? Because you know, that's the thing. That's why I'm so excited about being here now, is it feels like we've laid that foundation. We didn't do that for better billing or just to get rid of file cabinets, right? We did it for all the things that we can now sort of say, all right, what are we going to build on top of this foundation that we laid? Yeah. And that gets to our last two topics here. The office sent out an R5 for electronic prior authorizations. What, what's the driver for this? And what's the main objective of this RFI? Yeah, there's there's a couple things. ONC has done work with our partners in CMS on what are things that that provider consider to be burdensome. 
in general from a process and EHR perspective. And I think certainly one of the things that, you know, that I think we've seen with electronic health records is there is a concern that you, know, that you hear among providers of, oh, too many clicks and I don't like the EHR. And one of the things that I think that is, is certainly true once you look at that is that so much of what provider may feel as a burden is actually not the EHR. It's all the things that are being shoved through the EHR <laughs> uh, because that's seen as a vehicle for, oh, now we can do this. So now we're going to have these, these additional payer requirements, for example, or additional reporting requirements, for example, that's like, well, that wasn't about the EHR. That was about people trying to cram more and more things into it. And in a way, it just, you know, sort of magnified some of the some of the, the things that are pain points of our healthcare system. It's not about the HR, it's about the healthcare system that's behind it. And often we can't just tech our way out of that. You have to sort of figure out how you're going to do that better. So prior auth has just been a, a huge pain point. And we, ONC did some work early uh, a couple of years ago, and I had a big burden reduction report that pointed out that this is a big issue. We, uh, last year, our advisory committee had the uh, intersection of clinical and administrative data, ICAD, report, which also pointed to prior auth as being one of the top pain points and one of the areas that if, you, if we could tackle it using electronic health record systems, that would be a huge win, not just for, for providers. It's a burden on providers who have to you know, figure out the documentation and that creates payment delays. They spend inordinate amounts of time you know, trying to figure out with this payer, with that payer, with that payer. Do I do it on the website with them and a phone call with them and, and all of that? But it's also a huge pain point for people who are sitting there waiting, not knowing What's going on? Why can't I get this uh, this particular service? What am I waiting for? Where is it? There's this basic customer service that I don't understand. The provider's like, well, I submitted it to the payer. The payer's like, well, we don't know where it is, right? And you got all those things going on. So with all of that in mind, we said, let's just put forward. And also CMS, as you may recall, put out in December of uh, 2020. So just before the administration changeover, they put out a draft rule which had a specification for electronic prior authorization in it. And you know, like every rule that gets you know, put in just before the changeover administration, that sort of got paused. And now CMS is thinking about what they want to do with that. But you know, one of the things, they got a lot of feedback on that draft rule. And as we looked at that and we took in you know, sort of the input that we got from the reports, we said, well, regardless of what happens to that rule, it's probably worth our reaching out to the industry and saying, are there electronic ways that we can think about this that makes sense to include in, certificate, in certified EHR systems? Because EHR vendors have certainly you know, been pursuing different solutions with different payers. Um, different provider organizations have been pursuing different things. And we sort of feel like the industry has matured. We've got fire now you know, sort of available and rapid penetration of fire. And so now is the time for us to reach out to industry providers and technology developers and say, what do you think? Are there things that we could put into certification of EHR systems that would help us all move forward in this critical area? Again, regardless of what happens with the CMS. I know a lot of doctors are applauding any progress you can make. They're going to be applauding. That's it's and patients don't know that you should be applauding, but they 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 would be if they understood the the complexities and the challenges that exist in this. I do want to get to health equity. Health equities was a huge theme at the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference with many of the CEOs talking about their work in this specific area. I, as I was reading the USCDI framework, the version three, it, it's obvious that this has been influenced by this critical objective as well. What, what exactly is health equity by design and what are you trying to do there? Yeah, so, well, the first thing we're doing, uh, we're, first thing we're trying to do is trying to get a really operational definition of what health equity by design is. So. We've laid it out almost as you know, sort of a challenge to us in the industry to say there is a core construct that is very familiar, I think, to, in business process design as well as software design of you know, of saying that things that are so important and fundamental should be a part of a first principle of the way you design a system. And so we have security by design, privacy by design, safety by design. And so we think that health equity ought to have that same, you know, sort of consideration as well, that when you think of your initial design of a system, you should have health equity in mind and equity considerations in mind as you um, develop that system so that you're not trying to, you know, 
patch something together after or bolt something on after to rectify things that, you know, that, that frankly you should have thought of if you've made it a, you know, priority in your thinking to begin with. So that's the first, you know, just fundamental principle. And then how you operationalize that is much harder. So the way we've sort of thought about that is first, how do we think about data? And then how do we think about what might be technical capabilities in uh, with respect to kind of functions of EHR systems and, and associated workflows? So looking first at the data, for example, as you pointed out, we did include in the USCDI, this is the USCDI version two, actually, the where we included it, which was released last summer, that the first US, the draft of the USCDI version two, which came out just prior to the administration changeover, didn't have any social determinants of health data elements required in it. And so we took that, we took the industry feedback. It's an administration priority. It's an ONC priority. It's an HNS priority. It's a Mickey Tripathi priority. And we looked at that and we said, we are going to add social determinants of health categories in there. So we added four social determinants of health data elements into the USCDI version two, as well as the inclusion of SOGI, sexual orientation, gender identity data elements. And we already had added race, ethnicity, language in previous versions. So that was already there. So that gives us, you know, sort of a good full set of social determinants of health and health equity related data requirements that EHR vendors are required to support and make available as a part of, as a part of their interoperability. So that's just a core construct that you feel like that's foundational. If we can't identify who individuals are, then we don't have the ability to do the kinds of sort of understanding of are there differences in the, in the quality of care they're getting? Are there differences in their, in their access to care, let alone being able to act on those? So that's a whole effort that, that's already underway. As I said, USCDI version two with those elements got released. Now the industry is working to mature those standards. And we're hoping that that means that by the summer of this year, they are at a degree of maturity through the standards development process that they can actually be included in both government payment programs as well as commercial payment programs and other kinds of programs. The second part of this, how do you have functions, the HR functions that can, you know, that can help to sort of take advantage, let's say, of that data that's there to be able to do things that help to mitigate health equities before, before those inequities turn into disparate outcomes. So the data itself, well, that just helps you identify, gives you a more holistic view of the individual, arguably, but it doesn't help you to mitigate or intervene prior to these, these uh, issues that may be equity related, turning into bigger issues from a health care perspective. So that second part, let me give a specific example of what we're doing there. In August, we um, awarded to the University of Texas at Austin an innovation grant for them to look at how to electronically refer patients to social determinants of health driven kinds of social services um, in the same way that they can use their EHR to refer someone to a cardiologist, for example. So how do I refer someone to housing assistance in an electronic way? How do I refer someone to legal assistance electronically, for example, in the same way that I can easily refer them to a cardiologist? For, because for many individuals, that might actually be the next best thing you could do for them. Get them into more stable housing, and that might improve their health prospects a lot more than, than, than going to the cardiologist, for example. So that's you know, those are the kinds of you know things that when I when I speak of intervention that we're starting to look at to say how do we build those into interoperability. The last thing I'll just point to and I, I'll just touch on it is is algorithms. We're starting to take a really good hard look at that as well because as we know we've got more and more algorithms. I mean they're all over the place, right? Every time you and I get onto a computer, pick up our phone, there are algorithms going on in the background doing all sorts of things. And in healthcare, one of the challenges I think is that that every algorithm is biased by definition. It's, it was created based on a set of data, and that data has limitations. And the algorithm itself might have, you know, algorithm uh, might have, you know, biases um, just baked into the you know, the different methods that it uses to draw the results that it draws. How do we make that more explicit, so that you know, for those who are taking an algorithm, they are sensitive to the fact that this may not apply to this particular population. You train that algorithm at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, that may not apply at the, that hospital in, uh, in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I mean, you should probably think hard about that before you just blindly apply that, that algorithm in that, in that particular setting. So how do we think about that as well? I worked for St. Joe's in, in Orange County and we had uh, groups of people that focused in on health equities. And every time they came to me with one of the challenges they wanted to solve, it was such a naughty problem. It wasn't like, oh, well, just take the eraser and do this or take the pencil and do that. It was, 
oh gosh, we've got to get information from these third parties. We got to bring it in. We've got to normalize that data. We've got to figure out new outreach mechanisms because some of these people don't have phones. We've got to create relationships. I mean, they were naughty, difficult, challenging problems to solve. And I, I guess starting with the definition that everyone, it's a basic right that everyone should have access to a, a, a certain level of healthcare, right? Everyone should, that should be a, a basic right. Everyone should have access to healthcare. And I'm not sure we even have agreement on what that level of healthcare is, right? It is such a, when you said, hey, we're starting on defining it, I think some people might hear that and go, really, that's where we're starting? But it's not as easy as it, it might sound. These are really challenging problems. Plus, we're only talking about healthcare at this point. We're not talking about health. And health is... Yeah. So many other, if you tell me, hey, people aren't healthy, I, I'd rather have what they're buying and putting in their body. That data would tell me more about their health than probably their healthcare record. Right. Yep. No, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, we know that from a lot of research that, what is it, something like 80% of our health is actually determined by environmental and social factors. But that's certainly the case and knowing more about that. And you know, I think going back to the the thing of you know, we certainly can define the administration and you know, the Department of Health and Human Services, health equity we have defined, social determinants of health we have defined. The piece that I was speaking to is what is health equity by design, by mean? design. It relates to health right. IT. Health IT only plays a small role in this, right? But how can it you know help to improve the situation? I think that's uh, that's sort of the important thing for us. In the last minute, because we've gone up to the last minute here, how can people participate in this work? If somebody's listening to this, going, "Hey, I have a heart for that. That that really resonates with me." How can they participate? Contact us first and foremost. Feel free to contact us where our information is available on the website. My email is mickey.tripathy at hhs.gov. I'm happy to direct you to the right people at, at ONC. We are very open and accessible. I'm very open and accessible. And I'm always delighted to hear from people and particularly to plug them in you know, when they have energy and engagement around, around yeah. any of the issues that we're involved in. And if people are wondering, I sent an email to that email address and you responded to me. That's how you are on this show. So you are reading that inbox. It's not a fake inbox. I, absolutely. So. That's, that's my email. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Mickey, thank you again for coming on the show and sharing all of this with the community. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Bill. Really enjoyed it. What a great discussion. If you know someone that might benefit from a channel like this, from these kinds of discussions, go ahead and forward them a note. I know if I were a CIO today, I would have every one of my team members listening to a show like this one. It's conference level value every week. They can subscribe on our website, thisweekhealth.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Google, Overcast, everywhere. Go ahead, subscribe today. Send a note to someone and have them subscribe as well. We want to thank our keynote sponsors who are investing in our mission to develop the next generation of health leaders. Those are Serious Healthcare, VMware, Transparent, Press Ganey, Sempris, and Veritas. Thanks for listening. That's all for now.